Welcome in to the Rock Talk Studio, the podcast that answers the question, is this rock and roll book or documentary worth your time and money? Want to know what to read next or which film to add to your watch list? Well, here comes the inside scoop and all the details you need on the top recommendations and hidden gems you don't want to miss. I'm your host, Big Rick. Join me for an exclusive look into what's hitting the shelves and the screens and get ready to rock your reading and viewing list. And before I jump in the review, I want to take about 60 seconds and pull you into the loop on something new that I'm doing with the podcast. I I just want to pull you aside here, especially those who tune in every week. If you're new to the show, if this is your first time, welcome. Bear with me for a moment. First of all, I want to start with a big thank you to everyone who does tune in every week. It's really cool that there's a community here that enjoys the show because I still have a ton of passion for rock and roll books and documentaries. This is the 33rd episode that I've done in a little over a year and a half, and I've changed a lot and I've grown over the course of almost three years now. And most of you have hung in with me during these three years, and and I really do appreciate that. There is only one reason for some of the changes that I've made in the format along the way, and it has always been because I want you to enjoy the show and get the inside scoop on a good rock and roll book that I've read or a documentary that I've seen. Entertainment and value. That's what I ask myself every time I put together a show. Is this entertaining and am I creating enough value here? So with that said, I looked at what I am really doing with the show, and that is recommending what I feel is worth wild titles. And when I first started, I didn't realize how much good stuff is out there. I didn't think I could have enough material to do a show. I didn't think there was that many good titles out there. So that's why I came up with a rating system. And I know people like the rating system, especially the nosebleed you know, part. I get it. It was fun, uh, but I don't think it's necessary anymore. I only gave out one nosebleed rating over the course of three years. And I realized with the help of some of my listeners, and I want to shout out and thanks to my number one fan and friend, Bobby, and my boy from Austin, Texas, Scott, who helped me get to what I am really doing. And more importantly, what do I really want to do with the podcast? And that is to recommend new titles. That is the number one thing people ask me about anyways. You know, what's new? What do you recommend? What's what's the latest? So you are still going to get a review. I look at it more as a conversation to help you decide if this is the type of book or doc you want to check out. It will be something that I enjoyed and feel strongly enough about to pass along, and I want to pass along as much info as possible about that title too. Again, thanks for hanging with me. Thanks to all the suggestions and support. I promise a ton of upcoming entertainment and value around my passion, rock and roll books and docs including this week's book, I Don't Want to Go Home. So let's jump right into the discussion. How does a bar open a few years after a race riot that burnt down most of the town and actually thrive in the ashes? Mystics, rockers, rogues, and renegades. That's how. Well, at least according to Stephen Van Zandt, who along with over a hundred other contributors, tell this tale of the legendary Asbury Park bar, The Stone Pony. The book opens appropriately by really the only person that could and should introduce a story, and that's Bruce Springsteen. You wouldn't have the Stone Pony without Springsteen's contributions, but you also wouldn't have Springsteen's contributions without all the other colorful players and people who became the lifeblood of this bar. And that is one of the main themes that carries throughout this book. Author Nick Corsiniti uses all the interviews to map out how important music became to this neighborhood. With all else falling around it, Asbury Park was a really scary place to even walk down the street for a long time. The examples in the book of how dangerous a place this was are are almost too many to get into. So why did people literally take their lives in their hands to come to Jersey and this blown out town? It was all about the music. And this book is a full testimony about the magic that this bar had, the sound of the room, and the connection the artists felt with the audience. Dave Davies, Yorma Kikorian, Patti Smith, Zach Wilde, the Ramones, Tom Morello, Huey Lewis, Graham Parker, just a few, just a few names that share their 
really over the top love of what it meant to play this stage and how it's like no other room they've ever played. After the Springsteen forward, the book starts with, it kind of feels like a conversation of old buddies sitting around telling stories about the good old days. It's the beginning of the Stone Pony, and you get an inside view as it kind of defined its gritty, do-whatever-it-takes local place to be and really only place to be to hear and see great music. I like how the author, Corson Nitti, not only uses the main players to widen the depth of the story, not only just the big names, but also some of the, you know, almost real true heroes of the story. And that's the owners who took a huge gamble opening a bar in the first place in a town that was literally left for dead. The bartender stories are included here also. You've got the managers of the bar, the doormen all play an integral part in telling what was going on. It's really interesting that they can give you almost a day-to-day blow of, of what's happening at this bar. It's a captivating story of how they were winging it and holding together like a misfit family who made it their mission to cater to the music. It's a, a real nice balance. You have the musicians giving their thoughts on the feel of the place and how important it became to some of them to play there, married with what was going on behind the scenes and how they were able to keep the pony open. The bedrock of the beginning of the pony was Southside Johnny, Little Steven, and Bruce. And as Springsteen's stature grew, it became a thing when Bruce would show up at the pony. And so much so that the saying, Bruce might show up, became the tagline of the patrons. And it became a major draw and reasons why people from literally around the world eventually ended up flocking there. There was one payphone in the place. And if Bruce showed up, the line for the phone got nuts. But Bruce was comfortable at the Stone Pony. He lived very close to it. And he's quoted as saying, where are you most comfortable? Well, any place nobody reminds me of who I am. And he would just come down, uh, you know, hang out, have a few drinks, and sometimes get up and, and jam with whoever was playing. But this book is more than a Springsteen and his gang story. The Pony swerved with different musical genres to be able to stay alive. And it's really what kept them them hanging on. If they didn't adapt to the new sounds, it would have never have happened, even though it was a fight to keep the doors open most of the time. At first, it was definitely the horn-centered sounds of Southside Johnny and, and Little Steven on guitar, and eventually the sound Bruce and the E Street Band took to another level. But then it became punk. There's a huge punk time there at, at the Pony Jam Bands, indie bands, alternative music. And the book spends ample time on all the different musical eras that came and went at the Stone Pony. It also charts the rise and fall of the bar. It closed its doors in 91 and then in 98, only to serve as the centerpiece for the rebirth of Asbury Park in the 2000s, along with the musicians and those who worked there, politicians, and all of the three eventual owners contribute to the story There's a cool story about the second owner, Dominic Santana, and why he bought the bar after it closed the first time. He was kind of trying to figure out if this was a thing that he wanted to do and if it was the right move. And he drove by the property one day and he noticed there was a couple buses parked out front, which eventually unloaded a bunch of tourists who were all really excited to get out and take a bunch of pictures in front of the Stone Pony. And even though outside the bar, it was really just kind of beat up and there was graffiti all over it at the time, but that was enough. And that was enough for Dominic to realize that people from around the world, I mean, this is, was uh, an Asian tour bus, people from around the world know of this place and held it sacred. And I have to mention this because this book does something that should be mandatory of every book, especially oral histories. But in the beginning of the book, there is an alphabetical list of cast of characters You have their names and a line of who they are, musicians, journalists, radio DJ, bartender, owner, and so on. It serves as a huge reference when I was reading this book. Like any book, you forget the names and the players, and you're like, I can't remember who that was or how it fits into the story. And this just gives you a chance to look up who the author is talking about. All you got to do is flip back over a few pages to the front of the book. I used it a bunch mandatory for every book. Every book needs one of these. The book also includes 16 pages of pictures across the many years of the ponies, some of the pictures from famed photographer Danny Clinch, who also contributed a bunch of quotes to the book. He's in there a a lot. But it really all falls back on the voices that make up this oral history, 
There is a ton of rock and roll talent in here, yes, other than Bruce, that really contribute behind the scenes scenarios of why this stage was so famous and why it meant so much to them. Patti Smith even shares about how important the pony was to her mother. Her mother would attend a bunch of shows and had a real, real fondness for the place. I'm not going to spoil it, but Patty's story about when her mom was dying and the conversation with her about the stone pony was, to me, the wow moment of the book. 293 pages documenting the importance of this rock and roll shrine. This book really has a lot going for it. The amount of people that participate in this book give it so much depth and breadth. And what starts as a fairly singular tale of the locals who just happen to be Springsteen, Southside Johnny, and Stephen Van Zant becomes so much more as the other contributors expand on the credible story of one of rock and roll's most iconic never say die places. It's a place that is still there today because of the music. And the music is really the only reason why it survived. And this book is a great read about the people that this music meant the world to. Is this book worth your time and money? Absolutely. I highly suggest this one, though I do feel there are two questions that need to be looked at before you put down your money and go out and buy this one. The good thing for you is I have the answer to those questions coming up next. going to pause for a quick moment here because I've got some more recommendations for you. And those recommendations live in the archives of the show. They're free. They're still available. And there's some really great stuff in the last couple of months here. I can't say enough about the documentary Revival 69. It was fantastic. The best rock and roll documentary I've seen so far this year. And probably second place to that was uh, Stephen Van Zandt's Disciple Doc. That was really, really good. Highly recommend that. There's a couple of really great books that I just read, Prince and Purple Rain, 40 Years, celebrating the 40-year anniversary of that. Uh, That is a coffee table-style book that is tremendous, a beautiful production, and really, really well-written. Soul Serenade, the story of King Curtis was a great book that I read this year, and also uh, Chris Stein's Under a Rock. So there's a bunch of other rock and roll books and doc recommendations for you. Again, you can find them in the archives And if you listen to the show, you also know that I like to recommend Rock and Roll Podcast. And I'm going to recommend one this week by The Album Nerds, a very cool podcast. Let's hear what they're up to. Drop the needle on The Album Nerds Podcast. Just The Album Nerds. Just Album Nerds. Join Andy, Don, and Dude each week as they discuss albums from themes chosen by the Wheel of Musical Discovery. Heavy metal guitar virtuoso. Double albums. TV raps. Punk rock. The top 10 albums of 1986. Uncover hidden gems, revisit classics, and hear fresh takes on your favorite records. Exile on Main Street. Some of what country music can do best is that storytelling. This is a, this is a messy album, for sure. I just want to hear Floyd in, in everything, I think. Born in the U.S. And it sounds great overall as an album. I'm just not like moved by it. The Album Nerds Podcast. Three guys talking music. This is what we call freestyling. Yes. <laughs> That's what we call freestyling. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one else would call it that. Other people would call it find another podcast to listen to. Okay, so give it a spin wherever you find podcasts and albumnerds.com. That's the Album Nerds Podcast. Go on over and check them out. Two questions still need to be answered before we wrap up the discussion on I Don't Want to Go Home, the oral history of the Stone Pony. Let's do it next. Okay, the first big question here is, what if you're not a Bruce Springsteen fan? Are you going to enjoy this book? That's a pretty easy question. a pretty glaring question, I think. That's the big question I wanted to get into a little bit here. And my answer to that question would be absolutely. And the reason behind that is the extreme amount of different and diverse voices that contribute and the different music styles that are represented in this book. It really gives the book a more than Springsteen vibe. And I want to stress that. Uh, A case in point, Zach Wilde, the great guitarist, he talks in here about how he learned to play guitar by going to shows at the Stone Pony. I mean, you can't get much further away from Springsteen than Zach Wilde. There's also a ton on the punk rock scene, and that scene in itself takes up a big chunk of the book, and it kept the bar afloat for a long time. And even though it's known as the house that Bruce built, it's not written just glorifying Bruce. I also want to say that the book leans hard into what it was like 
living in and around the pony and, and in New Jersey at that time, even though Bruce is the first person quoted in the book and the last person quoted in the book, which I think is really appropriate, the amount of different people that contribute to the pages in between make this so much more than a Bruce Springsteen story. The second question, and I think this might actually carry more weight than the Springsteen one, is do you like oral histories? Personally, it's not usually my go-to. That list that I spoke of in the review of the cast of characters really made a huge difference for me in enjoying this book. Yes, you'll have to flip back and forth a bunch of times, and I did a lot, but it helped me and it'll help you stay in touch with who's speaking and it'll, it'll get you right back into what's going on. Also, the amount of different perspectives, I can't stress this enough, and the highs and the lows of the story are really engaging. I thought the author, Nick Corsiniti, who was born and raised in New Jersey and was once the New York Times Jersey correspondent, did a really good job of personalizing the story with all the different personalities and takes that created the legend of the Stone Pony. I hope that gives you enough insight to make a decision on this one, which to me, if the subject matter is something that you're into, I would highly recommend you check it out. Coming up in next week's podcast, it's a review of a new documentary about a reunion put together by one of today's biggest rock bands and one of my personal, personal favorite bands, The reunion celebrates one of the most heralded rock tours in the history of rock and roll that included a famous band that was put together by one of the most underrated players in the 70s and 80s. Bonus points go out to anyone who's listened to this show for a while because I did a book review on the band leader. Here's your clue. Master of Space and Time. Thanks for tuning in. Love talking rock and roll and getting a chance to recommend a title for you. Just because the episode is over does not mean the conversation is. You can join me on Instagram. I'm on threads, YouTube, Facebook for more book and doc talk. All right, tear it down, pack it up and head on down the road. We'll see you next time in the Rock Talk studio.